Hello, everyone. It's Charlene Lee here, and I am so excited to have as my guest my friend John Hagel. So, John, thank you so much for joining the show today. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Thank right. you. And um, we, I'm excited to talk about this this book that you have because it's something that we've been talking about on this live stream quite a bit, which is how do you deal with fear? How do you overcome fear? And I love the, the idea of your title, which is a journey beyond fear. Um, and so as, as we're waiting for people to come on board and, and as you're coming in, please um, share where you're coming from. And then also please share uh, how you are overcoming fear too as well. Just share a little bit about that. But John, what motivated you to write this book? Why now? <laughs> well, there were a couple of catalysts and I, I actually, um, I started writing the book three years ago, so it's not now, it's three years ago. Um, and the, the first thing was my business, my career has been in business strategy. I was taught to believe strategy is everything. You know, you get the right strategy, you win. Over the years, I've come to realize that it's less about strategy and more about psychology. That if we don't understand the emotions that are shaping the actions and choices, the best strategy just sits on a shelf. And then the second catalyst, and again, three years ago, I was traveling around the world as part of my work, and I was struck that everywhere I went, the dominant emotion that I was encountering was fear. At the highest levels of organizations, lowest levels, out in the community, everywhere, fear. And while I think it's understandable, I think there are reasons for fear, I think it's also um, very limiting as an emotion, and we need to find ways to move beyond the fear. And so that that became the catalyst for writing the book. Yeah, I, re I remember sitting with you at a conference in Detroit. I can't remember which conference, right? <laughs> but it was a couple of years ago, like four or five years ago, and I asked you what you were working on, and you were talking about this, the ideas of the foundation of this book. So I'm, I'm, I was so excited to see it coming out. We'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit. Sure. I just want to say hello to a couple people and then we'll dive into what the book is about. So um, thank you, Sandra, for joining from Chicago. Uh, uh, for somebody coming from Bangalore, Ismail from Algiers, Grace from Tanzania, and Gopal from San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. and, um, the, and David shares the thing to fear is fear itself. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a way to think about that. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the into the book. In the book, you talk about three pillars of ways to help these three pillars overcome fear. Uh, which, why don't you talk about those pillars and we can dive into each of them. Uh, explain it at a high level and then we can dive into each of them. Sure. So um, I should mention the book is really a combination of a memoir. I mean, I talk about my own personal journey beyond fear and the lessons I learned there and also a lot of research I've done over the past several decades that are related to this. So it's a, an integration of everything. And I came up with these three pillars um, and at a uh, high level, I call them uh, narrative, uh, passion and platform. The challenge I have, and part of the reason I wrote the book is I have a very different meaning attached to either any of those three pillars, narrative, you know, for most people, narratives and stories are the same thing. You know, you can use either word. I make a big distinction. For me, stories are self-contained. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end to them. And the story is about the storyteller or it's about some other people, real or imagined. It's not about you. You can use your imagination, figure out what you would have done, but it's not about you. In contrast, for me, a narrative is open-ended. There is no end to it yet. There's some kind of big threat or opportunity out in the future, not clear whether it's gonna be achieved or not. And the resolution of the narrative hinges on you. It's a call to action to say your choices, your actions are gonna determine the outcome here. So it's, it's a real, uh, sense, creates a sense of agency and, and motivation to move. Um, and I talk about narrative at many levels. Uh, individual, we all as individuals have narratives, corporate narratives, geographical narratives, movement narratives. So a lot of different layers of narratives. Passion, again, different form of passion. I talk very specifically about a form of passion that 
I came out of my research, which is called The Passion of the Explorer, and very different there. And then platforms. Everybody's talking about platforms today. The world's ruled by platforms. And I actually, again, have a different view of platforms. I'm focused on a very specific form of platform that I call learning platforms that in my perspective don't really exist yet. It's an untapped opportunity, a big opportunity. And I'm excited to uh, hopefully be a catalyst to help drive the creation of those kinds of platforms. So that's fantastic. Let's let's take into narrative for a second because this is the idea that captivated me in my conversation with you, how many years ago it was. And it, what I love about this is that you can see yourself in that narrative that's being created. And I, I think for in, in many ways, how does having a narrative connect to helping you overcome fear? Because it's such a powerful idea. I want to see that direct connection there. Yeah. And again, it could, can occur at many levels, but I focus on the individual narrative, our personal narratives. One of the things that I found is an interesting exercise. I believe we all have a personal narrative, yet very few of us have really step back to even express it, articulate it to ourselves. And when they go through that exercise, I found most people discover that when they look out into the future, the thing that is most motivating to them is threat. There's some kind of big threat. I'm going to lose my job. My community is going to be under attack. Something is threatening me. And there's actually very little call to action to others because I'm so afraid I can't trust anybody else. It's all on me. I have to figure this out myself. I'll find a way to make it through. So just that process of realizing I'm being driven by threat and it's generating fear and I'm being isolated as a result starts to be a catalyst to evolve narrative. I think we all have the potential to evolve our narratives and find a, an opportunity out in the future that can really excite and motivate us and draw other people in, be a call to action to others to join us in pursuing that. So I think it's, it's a key early step in terms of, first of all, acknowledging what's creating fear. And, and by the way, I would say for, mo for many people, even the process of acknowledging that we have fear is a challenge because we live in cultures where expressing fear is a sign of weakness. And so we hide from the fear, hide from our own fear, much less share it with anybody else. And I think, again, this process of articulating your personal narrative starts to see why you have fear and what's, what's shaping that fear. So. Right. And you talk you talk about these threat based uh, narratives, and is it how would you actually switch it to what you call an opportunity based narrative? What does that process look like? Because what? yeah, I just talk me how somebody would go through that. Because okay, I recognize that I have this narrative that isn't serving me. How do I develop a better and different one that's more opportunity oriented? Well, I think part of it's just really. Uh, pushing yourself to look ahead and see what are opportunities that are out there. Because again, I think with fear, we tend to shrink our time horizons and we just focus on the moment. There are actually a lot of opportunities out in the future. And the, the, ch the question that I think is helpful to people in, in evolving that narrative is to just reflect on where, what kinds of activities or, you know, people, who do you admire? What, what, it, excites you about them? What, where have you been excited in your life? And start to draw out what's that opportunity that cultivated that excitement and start to frame what's the opportunity out in the future that I could be pursuing and asking others to join me on, on that journey with me. Hmm. So, And it's, what I love about this is that it, it, it ties in so well into what I, I talk about, which is looking at the future, looking at the future opportunities, your future customers. Um, but you take it to a very personal level too as well. And that it has to start at that personal level before you can have it reflected back into the institution. Um, can you talk a little bit about how personal narrative now actually translates into institutional narrative? Because I think a lot of the people who listen to this live stream are very much leaders in their organizations 
And they need to not overcome, not only overcome the few that they have themselves, but the few of an institution. It's many people. <laughs> That's just like this big, huge boulder you're trying to push against. So how do I yeah. start taking my personal narrative and bring it to my organization? Well, I think it's, um, you know, there, there are two questions. One is taking your personal narrative and bringing it to the company. And then having the company frame a, a corporate narrative. And one of the things I find is that when I talk to executives about narratives, they say, oh, we have a narrative. <clears throat> we began in a garage. We faced incredible obstacles. We overcame them, accomplished amazing things, and more to come. It's a narrative. And my pushback on that is, well, wait a minute. That's about you. That's about your company. And again, I think that's a reflection of fear. When you're afraid, you tend to focus on yourself. To me, the most powerful and effective narratives at the corporate level are narratives that express opportunities for the customers that you're serving. What's the big opportunity for them that's most meaningful and exciting for them? And then what's the call to action to them in pursuing that narrative? And I'll just quickly say, there aren't, in my experience, many examples, but one that I offer is Apple in the early days of Apple Computer. You know, they had a narrative that condensed into think different. If you unpack that slogan, it was for decades we had digital technology that took away our names, gave us numbers, put us in cubicles. Now there's a generation of technology that can allow us to express our unique potential and individuality but it's not gonna happen automatically. You need to think different. Will you think different? And I think that's the, um, the missing element in the corporate narratives. In a world of fear, we tend to be so insular. And again, I think that can help also the employees within, within the company. If they see that there's an opportunity that's really meaningful and exciting to the customers, now I'm doing something that makes a difference versus just contributing to the bottom line, you know, makes a difference to the people we're, we're serving. So it's, um, I think, a missed opportunity and one that I'm hopeful more and more companies will embrace. And that's different from a purpose statement. You yes. talk about how narratives are different for purpose. So I hear from people like, oh, I've got a purpose. I'm like, okay, so tell me what it is. And they're like, <laughs> uh, I can't remember. So <laughs> you, you react to like, yeah, it's not a purpose. So Talk about how narrative and purpose work together, because I think your explanation of that is beautiful. No, thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, an important distinction because many people do say, well, that's our narrative, it's our purpose. But again, purpose is about the company versus the narrative, which is about the people you're serving. It's about that, what, what's meaningful to them. And once you've identified that, you know, what's meaningful to the customer and the call to action to the customers, then that provides a context to frame what could our purpose be? So again, to use the example of Apple, the, the purpose for Apple was to help customers think different, right? But that was their, the purpose for Apple. The, it still left the customers with the imperative, the call to action to think different themselves. If they weren't going to think different, nothing was going to happen. So. Um, yeah. yeah, I love how that eventually works its way into every employee being able to write their narrative onto the story from the perspective of the customer. And that, that I think that's a great segue into the second pillar I want to dive into, which is passion. Yeah. And in particular, you talk about um, how passion is like the fuel that you push, pour on top of the narrative to make it go faster and further. Um, and and I, you have this great two by two about yeah. the types of different passions. I'm like, well, John, you're really digging into this because it's not <laughs> just that you have to have passion, but there are different types of passion. Um, can you briefly go through that and then really focus on the passion that you're most excited about, the passion of the explorer and why that's so important? Yeah, it's again, the challenge I was facing was, you know, how do I differentiate what I'm talking about versus I, my experience is everybody has a very different definition of passion. It's one of those words that every individual has a different definition. And so part of my work was trying to differentiate major types of passion and, and talking specifically about the one that came out of my research, 
in terms of what's most helpful in, in moving beyond fear. And, you know, again, I won't go through the whole taxonomy, but one, one uh, L- form of passion is what I call the passion of the player. And we all know people like this who get really, really excited and motivated about something that's, that they've just encountered and they they pursue it with vigor. And then a, a day later, they see something else that really excites them and they move in a completely different direction. And so there's no consistency. It's just the excitement of the moment. Um, for me, the passion of the, of the uh, explorer, which uh, this came out of research that I did where I looked at environments where there was sustained extreme performance improvement. Said, so what can we learn from those environments? And what I saw was the participants in those environments had this very specific form of passion. And the elements, one is you're just, you have a long-term commitment to being in a domain. It could be anything from gardening to uh, marketing or sales, but your commitment is to be in that domain and not just be in it, but to make an increasing impact in it. So you're driven to have more and more impact. Second element is called questing disposition. People have this kind of passion when they're confronted with an unexpected challenge, their reaction is excitement. My goodness, this is an opportunity to do something and have more impact that was would, wouldn't even have been imaginable. So I'm excited. And then third element is what I call a connecting disposition, which is the first reaction of people with this kind of passion when they're confronted with these challenges is who else can I connect with who can help me to get to a better answer faster? Because they're driven to have more and more impact in this domain. And so this connecting uh, element is, is I think, a, a key part of why the passion, people who have this passion to explore are so effective in terms of having more and more impact and moving beyond fear. They see the opportunity to have impact, and that's exciting to them versus just um, you know, giving into the challenge. Yeah, interesting. You know, I hear the advice, which I, 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 I hear, especially for people early in their careers, no, just follow your passion, right? Yeah. And it just seems like it's such a bad idea because the passion may be your passion as a player versus understanding the narrative of what the impact is that you want to have. And yeah. then therefore having the passion of the explorer that's driven by your narrative. Any thoughts when some people say that, just follow your passion, what, <laughs> what does that trigger in you <laughs> in terms of the reaction to that? No, well, you know, it's, I, I, frame it as find your passion. Because I think most of us don't have, know what our passion of the explorer is. I think we all have it within us waiting to be discovered. Some you know, children at five years old know they want to be a concert pianist or an astronaut, or they're passionate from a very early age. But many of us haven't found a passion even into our late, you know, late part of our adult lives. But I believe we can all find that passion if we take make the effort. Again, it's a process of reflection to really see what is it that has excited us in our lives and that excite us about other people when we when we see them accomplishing things. Seeing the and seeing the pattern because in in many cases I talk in the book I I could easily say that I had the passion of the player because I was passionate about some very different things throughout my life. But when I stepped back to reflect on it, I found there was a common element in all those things that I was excited about. And that was my passion of the explorer. Um, and so, again, I think it's, a, it's a, a journey. It's a process. It doesn't happen easily, but you got to make the effort. And I think too many of us, starting as children, were told, forget your passion. Don't follow your pa- Forget your passion. Find a career that's going to be rewarding in terms of income and security, and that's what you should be doing. Become a doctor, a lawyer, because that's where you're going to make money versus no, (laughs) you may not be at all passionate about that. Uh, So, again, I think we've been cultivated with this notion of not following passion, not finding your passion. I think more more of us need to make that effort to find it. Interesting. 
I want to take a break and just say hello to other people, but also encourage you to please ask questions. I'm seeing the comments here. John, um, I can attest to you, loves questions. And frankly, the more <laughs> challenging they are, the better John enjoys them. So um, put in your questions. Let's see. We have a lot of people. Ron from Vancouver. Thank you for joining. Um, Navan from Nepal. Nelson from Nigeria. Yasin from Tanzania. Chandan. Uh, from India, Marcella from Brazil, uh, Brazil from India. I mean, John, this is a great audience to just hear mm. about these ideas. And it points to the idea again that these are not a North American or are just a, a central thing here in the United States. This is a universal topic. Um, totally. Yan from South Africa, mm. Lucky from Indonesia, um, Bakamusa from South Africa, um, Dr. Singh from India. And we have uh, um, a bunch of other people. Let's see, Christian from Nigeria. Um, Clinton Walker says hello to you, John. Um, and we have somebody hey. from Paris too. So oh. a really big, broad group of people here to hear about this. Uh, let's go into your last area, which is the platform and learning platform. So this isn't a platform like a technology platform, which I thought was so intriguing. Um, <laughs> And why, why did you find that this was such an important part to finish this trio of pillars? You got narrative, you've got passion, but why are platforms so important, learning platforms? Yeah, it gets back to uh, the commitment to having more and more impact and excited about an opportunity. And I find um, you know, one of the themes in my book is that as you cultivate your passion, find your passion and cultivate it, you should start to come together with some other people, small group of people. I, I call them impact groups. It's typically anywhere between three to 15 people. You form deep trust-based relationships with each other because you can learn a lot faster as part of that impact group than you can if you're just on your own and have much more impact as a result. So I think that um, the question then is, well, an impact group is still pretty small, maximum 15 people. Where Can't you scale your impact? And I believe you can. And I think it's a, it's a missed opportunity, an untapped opportunity, which is to create very different kinds of platforms. I call them learning platforms, but where the primary objective of the platform is to help people learn faster through action together and reflecting on the impact that they've achieved. And I hasten to say, when I'm talking about learning here, many people say, oh, well, you know, there are these uh, MOOC platforms where you can sign up for lectures and workshops. That's a learn. No, it, yes, it is a learning platform, but that's sharing existing knowledge. I believe in a rapidly changing world, and if we're really committed to having more and more impact, we have to create new knowledge at an accelerating rate, not just share existing knowledge. And that would be the, for, the function of these platforms is how to bring people together at scale to create new knowledge together, to have more and more impact in areas that excite them and motivate them. And back to emotion, I find that, you know, emotions can be contagious. If you're surrounded by people who have fear, that intensifies your own fear. If you're surrounded by people who are excited about an opportunity and having impact in addressing that opportunity, that reinforces your own excitement. And so I think that these learning platforms can be very powerful ways to amplify your excitement and motivate you to overcome the fear. Uh, John, can you give a personal example of what learning platforms do you belong to or are part of or have created to help you overcome fear? You know, I, I yet to create a learning platform. I, I'm actually um, in the process as part of the sequel to writing the book. I want to create a center that will um, have as part of it, it's offering a platform where people can learn faster together. And so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's something I've missed. I mean, I've, I've focused a lot on platforms throughout my career, but they've been more conventional platforms around you know, bringing, aggregating resources or social platforms, but mm -hmm. this is a different, different kind of platform. That's exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing what, what um, that center looks like. Um, 
I, I wanted to um, just draw out a couple mm. comments from people here. Um, Nelson shared this wonderful comment that passion is personal, but should be of universal benefit to the environment. So I, I really love that because it's tying together the impact, again, that you talk about in the narrative, but that's truly in the passion. And then you also have the platforms now that are, are pulling all that together too as well. No, absolutely. And I, I think, again, the passion of the explorer, the people who have this are focused on impact that's meaningful, not just to themselves, but to others. And mm -hmm. so it, it does have a social aspect to it that I think is, is very motivating as well. Yeah. Here's a question from Christian. Um, and it's basically, what should I do when the passion fades because the, the <clears throat> pay, the income isn't as strong? Um, so definitely is passionate about the job and the company job security strong, but the income isn't really what they need to take on this. It seems like a, a, a disconnect there and a dissonance that they're trying to resolve. Any words no, about this question? No, I think it's a, it's a great question. I think that's the challenge many people face because one of my, uh, my advice to people is, first of all, find your passion and then find a way to integrate your passion with your profession so that you can make a living from it. Don't just pursue your passion as a hobby after work, um, you know, make it part of your work. And so I think that the challenge for many is that they, they don't earn enough money pursuing their passion. But I think if they're really motivated, it helps them to come together with others and find ways to generate more, more income and, and revenue from, from the passion. But it's a question of really seeing the need to make that really your your uh, profession versus just you know something you do on the side and interesting uh because i know a lot of people pursuing their passions uh, as a side hustle because they're hoping that that's going to eventually um evolve and grow and it's and it's interesting because i'm, I'm actually doing this project now where i'm creating a cohort-based course so hopefully a learning platform where people are coming together to learn about disruptive. You're giving me thumbs up, so that's great. And <laughs> one of the things I'm doing this in is in a cohort-based course on how to create a cohort-based course. So it's kind of full circle. Right. And one of the first things they did for us is to say, write down all your fears. Like, what are mm. you afraid of walking into this? The very first thing we did together as a group. And then right. what are the consequences if that fear comes true? And what are you going to do to make sure that you address that fear in a concrete way in this course? You know, my fear is like, what if nobody shows up? What if it's not good quality? How is that going to hurt my reputation? And it was so healthy to get that all out there. And the thing they ended up was like, again, remind yourself, why are you doing this course? What is the good mm -hmm. you want to create? What's that narrative, I think? And I'm going to use a lot of what you talked about today to just get me through the creation of this course, because it's like, it, it is something I'm very passionate about. I'm joining with all these other people on a learning platform. So I think I'm on the right track um, yeah. in the affirmation of that. Oh, that's great. Just to hear, and Vinay has been great about just posting on here. Is it, he's been a teacher for the past 20 years and made a website back 15 years ago um, about his passion and was a big success. So I just wanted to share that too as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So we're coming up on the last few minutes of this broadcast. I wanted to just share a little bit of information about how you can find John. You can sign up with all the various materials he has on his site, his newsletter, his updates, his blog, um, so you can stay in touch with him and follow his work. And of course, there you can find information about his latest book, The Journey Beyond Fear. Just want to put that out there. Fantastic <laughs> book. Um, I'm sending this to quite a few people who I think would really benefit it from per personally. So I encourage you to take a look at it and pick up copies for your, your friends, your colleagues, your bosses. And John, before we, we start to close out, we'd love to hear from you. Any last words of advice? You know, just give us this, um, your, your parting thoughts about how we can think about um, overcoming fear and living the fullest life and opportunity that we can. Wow. Well, a key theme in the book is this notion that on one side, we as individuals need to acknowledge our fear and find ways to cultivate emotions to move beyond it. But on the other side as well, I believe we need to create and evolve the environments 
that will encourage us to move beyond fear. Because I think we live in environments today that actually are reinforcing fear. And so what can we do with the companies we work for? What can we do with the communities we're in, the movements we're participating in? How can we create environments that will really reinforce that need and desire to move beyond fear? And I think bringing those together, it's about the individual, but it's also about the environment those individuals are in. And how do we make both move beyond fear? Fantastic. Thank you so much, John, for joining us today. And um, also just wanted to remind people I'm doing I'm doing another live stream tomorrow, um, same time on why we need liberal space for seamless change. And John and I were talking about how liberal space allows you to explore moving from where you are over to what he calls the edge. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, John, for that input. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for joining today. Really appreciate you coming in. Um, and again, John, thank you so much for sp um, spending the time. You've given us the greatest gift possible, which is your time and attention and presence. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to share, share the perspectives for sure. Okay. Thank you everyone again for joining and hope you have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thank you.